Good morning. On behalf of the class of 2009 at Houston Baptist University, we welcome you to this fall commencement ceremony. Please remain standing for the reading of the scripture by Rachel Lytle and for the invocation to be led by Tony Davis. Following the invocation, please remain standing for the singing of the hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal. You will find the words to the hymn on the back of your program. We are reading today from John 1, 1 through 14 from the New American Standard Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came into his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he came the right to give become children of God, even those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful today. We're thankful, Lord God, first of all, that you reign, Lord, and that you are the only one and wise God. Lord, we give you glory for the things that you've done, and we give you glory for the things that you will do. We thank you, Lord God, for this institution and for all of its professors, Lord God. We thank you for all of the things that it stood for over these past years. We pray, Lord God, that you would protect us as we go forward into our new lives, Lord God. We pray that you would help us in the midst of uncertainty. We pray that you would give us faith in the midst of all of our struggles. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us, Lord God. Guide us in points where we just don't know what we're doing. We'll be careful to give your name all of the praise and all of the glory for these things. Lord God, I thank you for every family that's here, Lord, and every soul that's represented. Lord, not just pray for anyone who is here, Lord, and who is uncertain of you, or who doesn't think you exist, Lord God, I pray right now that you would convict them and that you would love them in a special way. I thank you, Lord God, for my time here. I thank you for showing up in my life. And I pray that you would continue to show up in all of our lives, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all of these students. We thank you for every professor, Lord God, and we most of all thank you that it's over. It's in your name. We thank you for all of these things. Amen.
Thank you. Please be seated. It is my pleasure to welcome you to these commencement ceremonies honoring the class of 2009. We are delighted to have you as our guest this morning in the Dunham Theater, which is a part of the Joella and Stuart Morris Cultural Arts Center. This morning's graduates represent those who have completed coursework since our last graduation, graduation ceremonies in August. It is a great joy for us to see so many families here today celebrating the graduation of their loved ones. It is a tradition for us to recognize the family members of the graduates who have helped make this morning possible by all your sacrifices, not only financial, but for all the prayers, the moral support, and the encouragement you've given. If you are a member of the family of one of this morning's graduates, would you please stand and be recognized? The university is guided by a board of trustees which is charged with the legal responsibility for the university. They are a blessing to all of us in that they serve the students by offering godly counsel and leadership to all of us. We are honored to have several representatives of the university trustees present this morning. I'll ask them to stand as their name is called and remain standing. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Dr. Ed C., who is the chair, Reverend Josh Guajardo, Mr. Norris Crownover, and Dr. Stuart Morris, Sr. It is also my honor and privilege to recognize a very special person who blesses us daily. Her godly counsel to the many students that she welcomes into her home, as well as her generous hospitality, brighten our campus. Please join me in welcoming the university's first lady, Mrs. Sue Sloan. Our special music this morning will be brought by one of our faculty members from the School of Music, Melissa Givens. Ms. Givens will be accompanied by the School of Music faculty member, Dr. Rhonda Furr. Child of Christmas rose 
Now would you join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Sloan, the president of Houston Baptist University, as he brings his charge to the graduates. Thank you so much. And Professor Givens, thank you for uh, inspiring us uh, so beautifully this morning uh, in the Christmas season. Tony, that was such a nice prayer. We all enjoyed hearing you thank the Lord that it's over. Uh, but uh, I know Tony well, and I know that she's wise and smart enough to know that, you know, it's never fully over. Uh, of course, what you meant was, and which we all understand, the classes are over and the final exams are over and all those research papers and deadlines and so on, but, uh, you know, deadlines are never over, and I know you're glad not to be paying tuition anymore, uh, but the Alumni Association has your name, and, <laughs> and we're, we're going to want contributions, Tony, uh, so it's never over. This is such a wonderful season of the year, and there are many markers, of course, of the season. You hear on the radio the, the loop of uh, seasonal singing, uh, the Christmas carols, the decorations, of course, are also uh, very prominent throughout uh, many neighborhoods, throughout the cities, throughout the city. And I, I suppose the most prominent reminder, physical reminder of the Christmas season is the, is the Christmas lights. We see the lights and we know that uh, by these seasonal decorations that uh, it is that time of year when we remember uh, Christmas, we remember the birth of Christ our Lord. The notion of light is very prominent in Scripture and it is very prominent with respect, uh, graduates, to the presence of God in fact, it was very prominent if, if you were listening to the text that was read this morning from the Gospel of John, uh, the, the word light and ideas of light are, are very, very rich there in that text. In him was life and the life was the light uh, of humanity. Uh, the, the notion of light is also suggested particularly in Scripture with, uh, with the word glory. Uh, Tony use the word glory several times in her prayer and it's a it's a it's a common term that we use in not only in prayer language but also really in in very secular and common language and and Tony used the word in her her prayer in in one of the ways that's very biblical uh, she said uh, things to the effect that Lord we want to give you the glory uh, that you are due and we give you glory uh, in our in our worship and with our our lives uh, that's one of the basic meanings of the word glory. It can have both a religious or a secular meaning. To give God glory is to give him the praise and the worship that he is due. Uh, we, of course, also in, in a secular sense, uh, as human beings, often seek glory. That is, we want acclaim or we want applause. We want the appreciation of those around us. And in that sense, human beings, too, uh, in, a, in a secular way, seek glory. The word glory has uh, a very rich, uh, a rich uh, story in Scripture. I won't uh, try to go into all the details of it, but it's, it's, it, it has a meaning, particularly in the Gospel of John, that I want to impress upon you as graduates because, uh, today because, because it has a, a kind of rich and surprising meaning beyond these obvious things that have already uh, been suggested and, and I think it's relevant for us who seek to serve God through Jesus Christ in the kind of world, the kind of world in which we live. So the story begins something like this. The word glory is very, is very prominent, for example, at the very end of the, of the book of Exodus when Moses the, has brought the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt and finally they've come to, to Mount Sinai and they've had various experiences there. At the very end of the book, or really the last, almost last half of the book, is spent talking about the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And the people bring all the materials and, and, uh, and, and Moses uh, assembles all of the materials uh, for the tent of, of meeting in the wilderness. And, and in the last few verses of the book of Exodus, in Exodus 40, 33, after Moses has assembled all of this uh, rich uh, material into this beautiful tabernacle in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant uh, is there with, uh, with, again, all the religious uh, furniture. Uh, the, the scripture says, and thus Moses 
finished the work. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord. Well, what happens uh, when, when the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle is that everyone has to leave. His presence is so powerful and so, so rich and so really overwhelming that, that Moses cannot stay in the tent of meeting. And, you know, why the word glory? Well, the word glory, again, its basic meaning is light. And the scriptures are very, are very clear. No one has seen God at any time. You can't see God, but you can see the light that is there when God is there. There is this radiance, this effulgence, this brilliance that, that shines and is present. It's sort of a heavy light that is there when God is there. You don't see God, but, but you, again, you see these, this marker. And this central marker of his presence in, in Scripture, this physical marker, is light. The same thing happens in 1 Kings 8. Solomon builds the temple. David wanted to build a temple, but uh, the Lord wouldn't allow David to build a temple. Solomon built a temple. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, again, when the last piece of holy furniture is taken into Solomon's magnificent temple, the Ark of the Covenant, on long poles, because no one wants to get near this Ark, because they, not because they've seen Indiana Jones, but because they, they have, they, there's another story they know about of a man who, who touched the Ark, and the Ark is a sacred uh, relic, and it has amazing... Uh, uh, strange things happen around the ark uh, and so they take the ark into the temple and we're told again and the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priests cannot minister there uh, any longer because this powerful light but it's a it's a, it's an overwhelming light it's it's not just the, the physical features of its of its shining but it's it's the heaviness and the richness of God's presence. A similar thing happens in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 1, you know, we know the song, Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Well, Ezekiel has a vision of, of, a, of a chariot. Well, it's the throne of God. And in the very last uh, verse uh, of Ezekiel 1, after he's had this brilliant uh, vision, uh, he, he describes the radiance. It's like the, rain, the appearance of a rainbow on a cloudy day. And he says, and such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord and Ezekiel fell on his face so again the glory it's this this presence one more that really when you think about it it's the same kind of thing that happens to Paul on the road to Damascus on the road to Damascus we, we read in all three accounts of his conversion in the book of Acts that a light shone down from heaven and Paul is blinded by the light he is struck down by the light and somehow in this light, he also later on tells us that he has had a vision of Jesus. He, is, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, am I, you know, uh, uh, and last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And, and Ananias says of Paul that he has, he has seen the Holy One. Well, this, this, this light, this, this glory... In fact, really, Paul later on describes it. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, I think it's about verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, I think it's about verse 6, but he's, it's something like this. He says, And God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He's thinking of that vision that overwhelmed him, blinded him, converted him of the risen Jesus. Glory. It's a rich term in biblical theology. And in the Gospel of John, it's got, it's got all of those ideas of light and radiance and, and praise. But in the Gospel of John, something else there is added. If, if, you, if you let me read just a couple of texts to you in, in the Gospel of John, uh, for example, in, uh, in, John, in John chapter 7, um, here, here's a meaning for the word glory that most of us relate to. It, it's, it's the way Paul uses it. It's, it's Jesus, the, the resurrected one, in, uh, in John chapter 7, when Jesus refers to the rivers of living water, 
It says, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And there glorified means not yet raised from the dead. But they, and John uses that expression several times in his gospel, where the word glorified means, means again, uh, uh, raised from the dead. But then John, in, if that's for me, just tell him to hold on for a second. Um, in, in John chapter 12, uh, he uses the word glory in, in another sense. And it's, it's a little strange. John 12, 20, there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew came, uh, Philip, and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is just before his death. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Well, well, maybe he means soon I'll be raised from the dead, but it doesn't quite feel like that because he goes on to say in the very next verse, Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And then a voice, a voice from heaven. This is unusual, but a voice from heaven. There came therefore a voice out of heaven that says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it. Some of the people standing around thought it thundered, and others said, no, we think the voice of God spoke to him. A shadow seems to come across this word glory. It's not just resurrection, but it seems to suggest that Jesus has a, a trial to go through, and God is going to glorify himself through Jesus' obedience unto death. And then the word glory becomes obvious in this dark, shall we say, difficult sense in, in the next chapter. Jesus is with his disciples at what we know to be the Last Supper. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of whom he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' chest one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, gestured to this other disciple and indicated to him, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. He, the beloved disciple, leaning back thus on Jesus' chest, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and handed it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after the morsel, Satan entered into Judas. Jesus therefore said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at table, knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he was saying, well, you should go give something to the poor. And so, Judas, after receiving the morsel, went out immediately. And here are the symbolism in John's words here. He went out immediately and it was night. When therefore Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. 
Glory means light and radiance and brilliance, and it has to do with praise and, and applause and honor, and all of us seek glory, and we give glory to God, but never forget that the glorious resurrected Jesus was glorified in the hour of his obedience, which was his suffering on the cross. Do you seek the glory of God? Of God? It is a glory, dear graduates, that is found in obedience, in integrity, in doing what is right irrespective of the cost. I may not be a prophet, but I can easily predict for you that if you live a life that is committed to doing the good, if you live a life that is committed to integrity, if you live a life that is committed to telling the truth, you will experience conflict, suffering, hardship for it. But remember in that hour, God is being glorified in your life. From this place, take what you've learned. Take the lessons of the classroom, of knowledge, of truth, of wisdom, and remember the one to whom you owe all things. And when you look at the Christmas lights, remember the one for whom your life should give glory. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Sloan. The academic year 2009-2010 marks the university's 47th year of operations and its 44th year to award degrees. We will honor 160 graduates from the fall semester in today's ceremony. This brings the number of students who have received degrees from Houston Baptist University since our first commencement in 1967 to a total of 15,817 graduates. We will be assisted in the awarding of the degrees this morning by Dr. Sloan, Dr. Ed C., Chairman of our Board of Trustees, Deans and Faculty of our Colleges, Dr. Chris Hammonds, Dr. Dawn Wilson, President of HBU's Faculty Assembly, and Ms. Erin Hughes, our Registrar. We will be recognizing our graduate degree candidates first, followed by our undergraduate degree candidates. All of the candidates for the various degrees who have completed degree requirements since our last commencement are listed in your program, although not all are able to be here with us this morning. It is permissible and quite customary at these ceremonies for you to applaud each candidate for the degree as each name is called. Dr. Sloan and Dr. C, would you please join me at the podium? Will all the candidates for the master's degree please stand? Dr. C, these candidates have completed all requirements for the master's degree from Houston Baptist University. The faculty and I recommend that you confer the master's degree upon them. Dr. Sloan, on the recommendation of the faculty, the Board of Trustees authorizes the conferring of the master's degree upon these candidates. Thank you, Dr. C. As recommended then by the faculty and authorized by the Board of Trustees, it's my privilege now to confer upon you the master's degree with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto, the degree that you have earned. God bless you. Please come forward and receive your degree. The hoods that you see are distinctive to Houston Baptist University by the orange and blue satin with which they are lined and by the color of the velvet trim which indicates the academic discipline being recognized. All the faculty and others have them on the stage as well as the students. The inside back page in your program explains the tradition of academic apparel. If you notice the academic gowns and hoods of the faculty, you will see the variety of colors of their doctoral institutions represented in the silk of the hood. You may also notice the mace, a very old symbol representing the authority of universities to teach and to award degrees, the seal upon the president. All of these things represent and remind us that education is not simply a commodity that we buy and sell. It is a sacred trust that we all engage in 
so that we may serve God and serve others. Dr. Bonicelli, it is my pleasure to present the graduates. Dr. Bonicelli and the deans and faculty will perform the hooding. The graduates will then receive congratulations from Dr. Sloan and their degrees from the president of the faculty assembly. Dr. Renata Nero, chair of the Department of Behavioral Sciences, will assist with the presentation of the candidates for the Master of Arts in Christian Counseling degree and the Master of Arts in Psychology degree. Receiving the Master of Arts in Christian Counseling, Aisha G. Mutope Johnson. <laughs> Receiving the Master of Arts in Psychology, Meredith Bauer. Jennifer K. Bemmler. <laughs> Julie Marie Liskowski. <laughs> Lisa McNerney. Dr. Alice Ledford, Interim Dean of the School of Education, will assist with the presentation of the candidates for the Master of Education degree. Receiving the Master of Education, Yvonne P. Arbavalo. <laughs> Priscilla Joy Bagley. Yadi Elizabeth Blessinger. Lauda Leticia Inojosa. Leticia Mari Holbert. Africia Comet Jackson. Flor Jimenez. Walter Laraquente. Rachel A. Marin. Hasid Hildegard Puentes. Gabriel E. Telez. Dr. Diane Lovell, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, will assist with the presentation of the candidates for the Master of Liberal Arts degree. Receiving the Master of Liberal Arts, Sophia Melanie Manning. Delandra Williams. Let's give all the recipients of the master's degree a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Sloan and Dr. C, could you join me again, please? Will all the candidates for the bachelor's and associate's degrees please stand?
Dr. C, these students have completed all requirements for the bachelor's or associate's degree from Houston Baptist University. The faculty and I recommend that you confer the appropriate degree upon them. Dr. Sloan, on the recommendation of the faculty, the Board of Trustees authorizes the conferring of the appropriate degrees upon these candidates. Dr. C, thank you. Then as recommended by the faculty and authorized by the Board of Trustees of Houston Baptist University, I'm pleased and privileged hereby to confer upon you the, the degree that you have earned with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. God bless you. Please come forward. <clears throat> Dr. Diane Lovell, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, will assist in the presentation of the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degree. Receiving the Bachelor of Arts degree, Kara Lindsay Baker. <laughs> Kelly Ann Blessing, cum laude. <laughs> Alicia Bowles, cum laude. Elizabeth Baldwin Burrow. <laughs> Kelly Michelle Calvert, cum laude. <clears throat> Chia Hung Cheng. Ariane Elizabeth Clayton. Kristen Crawley, cum laude. Tony Nicole Davis. Amanda Ann Dawson, magna cum laude. Christina Diana Dominguez, magna cum laude. Tamara R. Fitzgerald. Genevieve, Gra <coughs> Genevieve Grace Garza. <coughs> Erica Gonzalez. Victoria Gunnels Hodge. Chelsea Marie Hernandez, magna cum laude. <clears throat> Tyler Greg Horn. Tyler, Tyler will be hooded by his parents, Rusty and Kelly Brooks, professor and assistant professor of marketing in the School of Business. Candace Yvette Jackson. Ariel S. Johnson. Kelly Ann Konashek, summa cum laude.
Richard Lawson. Lauren Marie Limix. Rachel Irene Lytle. David Lee Mark. Augustin Alejandro Martinez. Isaac Martinez. Susan Munini Maioli, summa cum laude. Laura M. Muller, cum laude. Monica Tolotino Peralta, cum laude. Aaron Pizana, cum laude. Jeroya Zabeth Richardson. Carl Vance Russell, summa cum laude. Michael Wayne Simpson. Giovanna Chavari Suarez. Gazel Taparia, summa cum laude. <laughs> Veronica L. Tudor. <laughs> Ashley Dawn Wooldridge. Dr. John Yarrington, Director of the School of Music, will assist with the presentation of the candidate for a Bachelor of Music degree. Receiving the Bachelor of Music, Lauren Sinclair Nichols. Mary Shailen Eureka. Brittany Lynn Wilborn, magna cum laude. Dr. Margie Ugaldi, Associate Dean of the School of Nursing and Allied Health, will be assisting with the presentation of the candidates for the Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree and the Associate degree in Nursing. Receiving the Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Rachel Ruth Garza, cum laude. <laughs> Natalie Priscilla Guerrero, cum laude. <clears throat> Chenere Patience Iguilo, cum laude. Anna Jimenez. Tracy Renee Martin, cum laude. Kimberly Ann McCauley, cum laude. Love 
Yishimbet. Yishimbet Ayalu Mashisha. Brittany E. Meyer, summa cum laude. Casey Kathleen Mahalov. Angela U. Ohuba. Rosemary Wallace Pinkard. <laughs> Darian Ruiz. Cassandra Marie West. Receiving the associate degree in nursing, Diana A. Castillo. <laughs> Kristen Marie Foote. <laughs> Sandra Carnes Wood. Now may we give all our graduates another round of applause. There is one additional group of individuals whom we wish to recognize this morning on behalf of our graduating class. These are my colleagues who comprise the staff and faculty of the university. Will the university staff and faculty please stand to be recognized? Thank you. You may be seated. I would like to thank those responsible for the planning and execution of these ceremonies, Dr. Sloan, Dr. Ed C., Ms. Erin Hughes, and the registrar's staff, Dr. John Yarrington, Dr. Rhonda Furr, Dr. Chris Hammonds, Dr. Don Wilson, Sharon Saunders, Candice DeRosiers, Linda Clark, Paulette Cole, and many others. On behalf of the graduates, I would like to thank each of you for your presence, which has helped to make this ceremony a very happy occasion. We will conclude with the benediction given by Michael Simpson and the singing of the alma mater. The words to the alma mater may be found on the back of your program. Following the alma mater, please remain standing until the graduates and faculty have cleared the immediate area. Please stand. Michael. Please join me in prayer. Jesus, you are the king. And for everything we've been given, we have you to thank. As we leave Dunham Theater for the first time as graduates, we are thankful for the community that students are able to experience here at HBU. Many of us matriculated as children, but because of your scandalous grace, we are able to graduate as adults, more fully equipped to handle the trials of a fallen world. Be with us, guide us through such trials. Let all of our endeavors be to the glory of your name and for the advancement of your kingdom. Let us remember the classmates, fraternities, sororities, and student organizations that have contributed to our spiritual, social, and academic development. Let us remember our distinguished professors and their unwavering commitment to our success. And finally, let us with pride remember all we have experienced at our alma mater, Houston Baptist University. Amen.
we thank you for celebrating with us at this commencement ceremony. Please be mindful of guests who will be arriving for the second ceremony. And now the alma mater. Thank you. 